Hey, you gotta watch me look down. Okay, I'm just setting up my little monitor to make sure I can watch it. It uh, erased itself. And let's see. Hmm, now my computer is frozen. Okay, so I am on, and it looks like it is working. We'll see. I've had some computer issues, but it seems to be like that every morning. And Oh yeah, I was looking for 1800s baseball names, and for some reason it wasn't, um, what was I looking for? Yeah. If you want to know what I was looking for, this handy little chart will tell you your uh, 1800s baseball name. So if you play it in the 1800s, you look at the first initial of your first name, middle name, and last name. So for example, my... Uh, 1800s baseball name would have been Crazy Pete Henderson. And uh, that's kind of a big deal. And you can play this game on your own too. I was going to put the link on here, but for some reason my uh, right click isn't working, so I can't get it to save. So I'll do it another time. And so, and so, let's go ahead then and get started. I think, can you see me now? Is everything working? Uh, this is Crazy Pete Henderson here, coming at you with... Uh, a little bit more about Nazi Germany. I should add something. I put up the review packet and it is eight pages and I actually took off a couple pages. I went through and called out a few of the terms. I was trying to narrow it down to things you can use on your DBQ. And just a little quick review on the DBQ. It's, uh, you're gonna have five documents, five documents to choose from, you must include information from four that reinforce your thesis, and then for two of them, you must show how that article, either either the, um, the author or the map, was influenced by the historical content, historical facts going on in that era, the purpose of it, or its point of view. Audience and purpose are virtually the same thing, that's why I don't worry about that as much but you must also show the purpose and point of view for two of the four documents. And if I wasn't clear on that, I'll try to be more clear in the, in the future. I will go over it in more detail. So we are going to do a DBQ on the dropping of the atomic bomb. And for that one, we're gonna alter it, even though the DBQ I'm gonna give you because I have the one on file. I'll see if I can't tinker with it, but it has eight documents. And I'm gonna just either tell you to ignore to ignore three of them, or you could pick whatever four you want, and that one will be now a four-paragraph DBQ. And I'm not sure exactly how that's going to work. Um, I got to play with a little bit more. The actual format of the DBQ won't be any different from the World War One DBQ we did on the Treaty of Versailles and the ratification. But most people did pretty well on that one. And then after that, we'll do partial ones where we'll just uh, organize and do one or two, we'll do one paragraph, or just talk about how we'll do one or two documents. And for that one, I will give you some, and also you have your review book. Don't forget that review book is a great resource, and it has lots of practice DBQs. You just have to alter it thinking, now I'm not gonna use 60 documents, I'm gonna use four. And also on there is a little bit of reading for America through the first part of World War II. 
And that's right where we quit. We went over the issues of fascism and talked about the about Mussolini. And fascism is such an important issue because not only would it personify the modern authoritarian dictatorship, very uh, ultra right wing, ultra conservative. And by the way, calling somebody in the United States a conservative does not mean that they're a fascist, just as like calling someone a liberal does not mean they're a communist. We're just talking the extreme end of that. And how Mussolini set up this idea of the cult of the leader, that the leader is never wrong. It is intensely anti-liberal. I'm looking around to see if my things working. That's one thing I have a little bit of issues with that. It's intensely anti-liberal. Liberal ideals like democracy, individual rights, or for that matter, uh, rights for people who are not part of the dominant race. Remember, there's this idea of a superior race. Those people, by giving them equality, makes the state weak. People voting weakens the state. People with individual rights weakens the state. And uh, the intense militarism, the intense, uh, this leads to imperialism, intense nationalism. Please go back and review those issues of fascism. On the test for this unit, I'm going to ask a very specific question about the elements of fascism. And this is important because it's on the rise again. A fascist government has taken power in Hungary. It is on the, it is nearing fascism in Poland. Fascist parties are growing all over the world. And fascist elements are appearing everywhere. And so we did that and then talked a little bit about uh, Germany. And remember this picture I'm putting up right here, that is the Free Corps. And the Free Corps, those are the militia who fought in the streets in Germany against communists, against ultra-nationalists, and that cap pushed. And remember, they couldn't have elements of the, the German army because of the Treaty of Versailles, so they used elements of the cross, and that's where you get the swastika. So, right there we get to the Weimar Republic, and I mentioned how this was seen as more of a decadent republic by those who want to return to the way that Germany was before. And I must emphasize that again. Remember we talked about the 1920s. 20s, how conservatism, a lot of the conservative element, and that included the fundamentalism, remember the Scopes monkey trial, the fundamentalism, the idea to go back to the way it should have been in the past, not the way it was, the way it should have been. So a lot of these ultra-nationalist groups in Germany, they looked at the Weimar Republic as being decadent, as being um, a break from what made Germany a powerful country. And they want to return Germany to the way it was before, but not the reality of the way it was before, their imaginary version about the way things should have been before. So here we have uh, my idea of decadence, people on tall unicycles in front of the Brandenburg Gate. I agree, very decadent. And so, this Weimar Republic was created out of the ashes of World War I, ashes of Civil War, but it created the modern German state in many ways the good and bad elements of it. And remember how Germany is divided in two. You see that little finger of Poland? We talked about that for the Treaty of Versailles. So one person we have to get to again, oh, a familiar name. John Maynard Keynes was part of the British team at the Treaty of Versailles, at the Paris Peace Talk, is what I meant to say. And he looked at what was happening with the reparations and the impact that's going to have on Germany, but not just that, the breaking up the, of the Austrian Empire and the Ottoman Empire, but especially the reparations for Germany. That's why I put that picture I showed you before of the reparations crushing the German public. And he wrote the economic consequences of peace. And then he laid out that these reparations might lead to severe repercussions in Germany, especially down the road. Let me make sure this is working okay. Hey, there I am. So, this will lead to severe repercussions. And he warned that the reparations weren't big enough to keep Germany from rebuilding its economy, per se. But at the same time, they were big enough to cause an internal strain, but more importantly, a huge political strain. Remember, Keynes and Keynesian economics look at political economics much different than previous economists. They looked at, he looked at it as economics and democracy were intertwined. And if there is severe strain on 
that working class and middle class that could have severe political repercussions. That's why he warned against, for example, Roosevelt cutting spending in 37, or Roosevelt wanting to in Congress passing that leading to the Roosevelt recession. He warned against this, yet Germany still went on through it. And we're leading to what happened in 1923. Now, for reasons I can't explain, I did not write 1923. So please write 1923. But Germany was trying to make these reparation payments. And they did a number of things to devalue their currency, to make their currency of lower value, to make the payments. But they had been having trouble in 21 and 22. And in 1923, they quit reparation payments. They said, we can't do it. Now, this was partially hardball, pol hardball politics by the Germans. They were saying, hey, are you going to make us start paying again? What are you going to do about it? They were hoping to coerce France and Britain to quit demanding the payments. But the French, who were having their own economic problems at that time and political problems, they reacted strongly to this cutting off of payments by occupying the Ruhr land. Now, the Ruhr land is this area right here. Can you see my mouse? Let me get my little pointer out there. Okay. This area right here. They occupied that region. Oh, I should add, when I'm grading your test right now, I just thought about this while I'm looking at this. And I am not looking for things from your textbook. I'm not looking for things from your review packet. I'm not looking for things, the generic words from my generic words from my uh, uh, presentations I will also let you look at. I'm looking for what I talk about in, in these class sessions right here. So if I don't see that, I will dock you immensely. Just letting you know, I'm getting a lot of tests and most of them been really good. So let's make sure that you keep up with this. Make sure you jot, write down the main facts, not just what I write down here. But back to this. So the rural land. They occupy this, the most industrialized region of Germany. And they, they, this was allowed technically in the Treaty of Versailles. Oh, you might notice this purple area right here. That was the demilitarized Rhineland area. So this is a, Ger a French soldier in 1923 confronting a German civilian in the streets of, it's a Dusseldorf. But Germans went on strike. And here are striking German workers. They refused to work. All right, the French coming in, they're going to take all the fruits of our labor. They quit working. And this was fueled by not only German trade unions, but also political parties. Politicians, they wanted to show that I have to leave. Somebody's at my door. So, I'm back. Did you miss me? Well, at least act like you missed me. All right, so, they went on strike because they're not going to work to have more money for German farms. Well, what happened was this. With the French troops coming in. And there shows how French troops guarding a coal train, and there is a German worker not working. German political parties pushed this because of the anti-Treaty of Versailles feeling at that time. This totally stopped German exports. So let's review a little bit about what Germany needs to pay the reparations. Germany needs exports. They need to sell goods and have that money coming in. Hard money in the form of gold-backed currencies because that's what the French and the British want to pay for the reparations. And this Stopping of exports would trigger what we call hyperinflation. And this is incredibly high inflation, something that you can't even comprehend in your lifetime. We have a time now of deflation, and you've never seen in your lifetime inflation. A couple times where oil prices, like when you were 10, went up to about four bucks a gallon. But that is just in one minor area. In, in 1979, 1980, inflation was about 
We're talking inflation of 100% an hour. Prices doubling every hour. So what happens is this. The Germans need to export goods. So they have to take their industrialized goods and export them to France, Belgium, Brit uh, Britain, the United States. But even they're hoping to get the new Soviet Union who needs everything. And so they need hard money, that money coming in. And then what they do is that money comes into German industrialists, the German government taxes it and takes that money and pays the reparations. That was the thinking behind the reparations that that tax hit will so stifle German industry that they can't rearm. But Keynes said it's not enough to do that, but it's enough to cause real impact. And he's going to be proven correct. With the strike in the war, no exports. No exports. Immediately, overnight, no tax revenues. This should remind you of something. Let me think. Let me ponder it. Oh, yeah. All businesses all over the United States shutting down because of the pandemic right now. All of a sudden, boom, everything shut their doors. No one's working. Today, another 6.3 million workers apply for unemployment insurance, and that appears to be understating that num um, understanding the number of people who are unemployed by a factor of two, two times. So this is happening in a way right now. Now, the United States does not have to worry about reparations or worry about getting gold. So the U.S. does not have the same issues, not even close. But just imagine how this would affect Germany, who all of a sudden has no tax revenues of gold-backed currency. How do they pay their reparations? They can't. Even if they want to repay their reparations, with France occupying the Ruhr, they can't. And so this was a horrible move by Germany and France, in a way. And so Germany's only choice was to inflate their currency they had currency that was not backed by gold. But with no tax revenues to back the value of currency, the value of currency dropped like a rock. That means inflate means to devalue. That is why tax revenues are so important today. If the US government cannot tax, if the power of tax goes away, where people think tax revenues are worthless, they will think that the U.S. currency, backed by tax revenues, will be worthless, worthless, and inflation will skyrocket and interest rates will go up. That is why we do not have that problem now. Yes, there was an issue about, the, uh, about tax revenues, and so that is a, a problem, but the U.S. does still collect taxes. The U.S. does control its currency. So this cannot happen here unless the United States system economic system um, we have right now disappears and we can't collect taxes. Well, with inflating the currency and no tax revenues invented, they just basically had to come up with the idea of just print money to make up the difference. And so this would devalue the currency combined with expectations of inflation. I capitalize the end for some reason. The expectations of inflation. If people believe that the value of money will be lower tomorrow. That means if people believe that prices will be higher tomorrow because your money can't buy as much, they buy their products today. I better go buy, like for example, if you think gas prices are going to skyrocket tomorrow, you fill your tank today. Well, if everybody does that at the same time, prices go up. If prices go up, people are thinking, oh no, prices will go up even more tomorrow, and they buy even more. Just imagine if that happens to everything. Just imagine today, if you believe that tomorrow food prices will go up, which is a definite possibility, then you're going to want to stockpile today. Think about what's happened with toilet paper or hand sanitizer today. People believe, I better get it today because tomorrow it's going to be in demand, it won't be enough, and prices will skyrocket. It applies, all these things apply today. That gets back to another lesson about why we learn history. We learn history because it, it is the only indication, our only way to predict the future is knowing our past. And those who know the past can easily manipulate those who don't. So, with this, everybody started buying everything and the value of the, um, 
of the German mark called the uh, Reichsmark went up dramatically. So here's the value, the number of German marks, marks required to buy a dollar. And there already had a lot of inflation. Right at the beginning of 1923, it was over 100 marks to a dollar. Look what happened as prices went up. By the way, this map, this graph is not very um, proportional. But we're talking eventually by the, by the middle, by the summer of 1923, it is going to be over 1 billion marks to buy $1. That means one dollar, you can pretty much get as many marks as you ever dreamed. Get any product you ever wanted. And if you had a thousand mark bill by the summer, it was completely worthless. That's why I have all these pictures of children making kites or toys out of old marks because they were worth less this than, and I'm not exaggerating, toilet paper. And so here's a number of marks to buy one ounce of gold. As you can see, when hyperinflation um, just started at the end of 1922, 30,000, 87 trillion. Is that a trillion or is that? Um, that's, it's hard to even wrap your mind around this. Here is a 50 million mark note. When I was in Germany back in, this is 2001, I was in this little store and I bought a 100,000 mark note from 1923. And you might think, well, wow, that's kind of rare. That'd be worth a lot. No, it's worth nothing because they printed so many. And people would get paid in the morning by the summer of 1923. And that money would be worthless by mid-afternoon. They would be paid in bundles of bill, bills. People would carry wheelbarrows full of, of marks to go get a loaf of bread or a quart of milk. The value of their currency dropped. In your lifetime, this has happened in Zimbabwe to a lesser degree in Argentina. It happened in Venezuela. When people thought the tax revenues of the country were not going to back the currency, and so I don't. And so, uh, and so it's hard to even comprehend today. And yes, it is logarithmic. And that gives an idea because if not, the chart would go off. Um, um, off the scales. And so with that, here's another 9 billion mark note. In fact, they were printing on so thin, it was literally thinner than toilet paper. That is a stamp, a postage stamp for 2 million marks. It would cost 1.5 million marks to buy a loaf of bread by 19, September of 1923. Money became incredibly worthless. Here are the wheel, wheelbarrow of money jokingly to go pay a paycheck. Here is people giving barrels of money to buy bread. And I should add one more important thing about this. Just imagine if you had a savings account. You have small middle class, have a savings account. The savings account's worthless. It's like having no money at all. It's like your bank collapsed. If you're on your paycheck or let's say a pension, a lot of people on a pension in Germany that remember what social security was, there was an old age pension in Germany. And that pension would be worthless. This led to incredible, especially middle class and upper class insecurity. And that's why to this day, Germany has an almost myomic fetish about inflation. And a couple more comical shots about using money as wallpaper, etc. Well, these middle class insecurities would lead to a crisis in Germany. And this is important. These middle class insecurities would not lead to the collapse of the Weimar Republic, but these middle class, middle class insecurities will be on their mind in 1932. But this time, it's the exact opposite issue, the Great Depression and deflation. But those insecurities will lead to middle class support of the Nazis. And here is Gutenberg, the inventor of the printing press, and he's basically saying, my God, my God, look at what's happened with the printing press printing out money. Uh, Gutenberg was a German. And so, with that, with all of these insecurities and economic disillusionment, that is when the emergence of a new political party. There's a, all these right-wing ultra-nationalist political parties. And Adolf Hitler, there's Adolf Hitler in this picture, that, so this is a scanning of a picture in somebody so you wouldn't you would know, put A-H, so you know that would be Hitler. But Hitler was a veteran. 
He had been twice rewarded. His military history, no one's really sure because Hitler lied about everything. We know basic elements of it, but Hitler, when the war ended, was in a hospital because he had been gasped with mustard gas, he had been blinded, and he really bought into that myth I mentioned before that the German army was never really defeated. He was, like a lot of soldiers after the war, violent, embittered, angry at this, wanting, they thought they were fighting for a greater Germany, and what they saw out of this was Germany in decline. He would join the street fights when he got out of the hospital. He, this is ironic, would join the socialist revolution in um, Bavaria for a while, and then join the free corps who bashed the socialists in Bavaria and reestablished, or, uh, at first, a Bavarian government that would join the Weimar Republic. And so he's back and forth. But while this was happening in the Free Corps, he was noticed by the German military, that's now much smaller German military, who was desperate to use their intelligence service to root out potential threats, both right-wing authoritarian and left-wing communist threats to the government. And so he was recruited, Hitler, was recruited as a, sp as a spy to join, and I put this up here, it was actually not the National Socialist German Workers' Party, it was the Germans' Workers' Party. He was, he was recruited to spy on the German Workers' Party and to find out if this right-wing party, mostly made up of veterans, ultra-right-wing, but had this kind of uh, working-class appeal to, wor um, to workers. He joined it, and this is his ID card. It says, you can read it on there, it says the Deutsche Arbeiter Party, the DAP. And there's Adolf Hitler. And the thing about Hitler, we're not going to go into all the details about this, but being a spy, he was actually being subsidized by the German military, the German Reichswehr, German um, Reich's army, to spy. And so he, had, he could commit full time to the movement, which should be kind of funny because this committing of this spy to full time, he realized, I like this movement. And he was influenced it and joined it full time. One of the great ironies is that Hitler became a Nazi because he was recruited as a spy to try to stop the Nazis. Well, to appeal to working people who socialism had a great appeal, this ultra-right-wing, very anti-socialist party would adopt the term, or would adopt the name, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or the ND, the NSDAP. And virtually everybody called them the National Socialists. And so most of the time, it's more proper to actually call themselves a National Socialist. But as an abbreviation to the Nationalistic Socialistic Deutsche Arbeiter Party in German, the first couple letters of national, N-A, and the middle couple letters of socialistics is Z-I, in German spelling of socialist, you will get the Nazis. And that would be the abbreviation for the Nazi party. They adopted the swastika to appeal to veterans who were in the Free Corps. This was a very localized, very right-wing party who wanted to return Germany to the, the greatness of the German Empire. That is why their colors are going to be red, white, and black. Why red, white, and black? That was the color of Imperial Germany. So, the Nazis. And Hitler started out as one of the leading members, Clive Drexler, or Clive Drexler, who was a basketball player for the Portland Trailblazers and Houston Rockets. But, sorry, now, I'm, now that makes me laugh. Clive Drexler. He, no, Clyde Drexler was not an Nazi. He was a really good basketball player. But Drexler was the actual head, but Hitler would eventually uh, take over the party because he had those skills, the same skills that would lead him to be recruited by, by the German army. He had the skills to lead, to appeal to regular working class people. And even though he thought very little of the lower classes, he was a firm believer in social Darwinism and believed that he was born to lead. Remember, fascism 
and social Darwinism go hand in hand. He still had this way to appeal to him, this very odd thing that happens so often but seems almost counterintuitive. Here is a leader of working class people and middle class people who actually holds the very same people he leads in contempt. But in 1923 during hyperinflation, they, oh here are a couple of pictures of Reichswehr in the right, the, I'm sorry, the, 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 the uh, free corps in, this is in Berlin and this is in Munich. Those are the people he would appeal to. And he would use the hyperinflation as a, a feeling that the German Republic's going to collapse and all they need is one push. And so here are members of the Free Corps, but recruited by the brand new now National Socialist Party. And here is Hitler meeting with leaders of the National Socialists in meeting, and they are meeting in the Hofbrauhaus. The Hofbrauhaus is a big beer hall in Munich. If you know anything about, especially the Bavarian culture, beer halls are a huge part of their culture where especially men go and meet, and what a great place to recruit. Buy beer for your new recruits. Get them to come. Then you remember who bought you the beer. And I should add the Hofbrau House, to this day, it survived the war. But to this day, in the upstairs, it still has fascist symbols, so Nazi symbols in the upstairs that are still there. In this place, they only open up for special occasions. But uh, when I took a tour of Munich, you went up, I went upstairs and looked at this Hofbra house. And there are still, well, most of them are now gone, but that's still a place where the remnants of the National Socialist and new fascist parties, which are quite popular in Bavaria, meet. And so, with that, I should have one uh, quick story about the Hofbra house. So, when I was there in 2001, and uh, you know, we went there because it's part of, it's a very touristy thing to do, a little earthquake hit because I kicked my table. My wife and I were in there, and we were uh, sitting at this table, and a friend of mine told me to look out for this, that uh, there's these old Nazis who hang out there, and they have these massive leader high steins full of, of German beer, you know, beer, and they walk around with these things, and they were like later hoisted in all these traditional Bavarian costumes and they walk around and you know sing and make kind of a big deal. They seem almost comical. They seem almost like they've been paid by the Hofbra House to come there to show Bavarian culture, these old men. But I was watching them and I was told to look out for this. And when they see each other, they start doing this. I don't know if you can see me, but they would, hmm, can you see me? I'm standing up here. They would put their arm out like this. Just like a half little of that Roman salute I told you. Kind of each other, like, kind of see each other, give them a little salute, kind of nod and walk on. Then, oh, I was singing and stuff, and they see each other, and just go like that. And it was kind of scary. It's like, oh, look at those old guys. Oh my God, they're Nazis. And it gives you an idea how this whole idea never really left. Just as you could see ideas going back in America's past have never really left. And a lot of this kind of superiority and this national socialism sticks. And I was going to say, you know, well, these guys are probably all gone now, except, you know, there's a whole new batch of them, I guess, being born all the time. And the actual, they actually organized this attempt to coup at another beer hall that was destroyed actually in World War II. And that is why this attempt to overthrow the government is going to be called the Beer Hall Push. And this was to take advantage of German hyperinflation. And so with that, there is a very good picture of Hitler. Hitler, I hope you enjoy the comical picture of Hitler in Lederhosen and the swastika showing. And yeah, I'm uncomfortable looking at it too. But those are Free Corps members, but now allied with the Nazis. And here they are being driven through the streets of Munich. And what they thought was, is they could overthrow the government of Munich, take power, and then announce they had secret meetings with a former general called Ludendorff, and I just had a knock at the door, but then they left. I think it must be a package. I'm going to not worry about it. In fact, I'm going to worry about it. I got a package. Well, it was a 
isn't this great? You get a, a, another feel about, uh, about the way life is. I think it was my neighbor once got the package by mistake and then dropped it off and just kind of left it at our door. Oh no, it's FedEx. All right, well, we'll see what it is. I, I don't remember ordering anything. See, this is another time you get a, get a little bit of an insight into my life. Aren't you excited? No, I guess not. <laughs> I wouldn't either. They went to Eric Ludendorff. Remember Ludendorff was the general came up with Total War, the one who did uh, Unconditional Submarine Warfare. He had also told you how he had gone pretty much insane, had a total nervous breakdown by... All kinds of stuff's going on. A total nervous breakdown by the end of World War I. But he was this German hero. And what they thought was, is then they would say Hitler or Ludendorff has returned and he will take over Germany as dictator and bring back German, the German monarchy and when Germany was a great country again. And so here is Hitler posing with Ludendorff right before the coup. And so that was the plan. They would march in, install Ludendorff, and the entire country would be overjoyed that Ludendorff is back and they would take power kind of triumphantly march on Berlin. Now, the Nazi party was just a tiny party only in Munich, but it's only a tiny little bit of Munich, but they thought this would be enough to take over full power. They just thought they would, the whole government would collapse. And they had a precedent. The Bolsheviks during the Bolshevik Revolution, which happened in the October Revolution, which happened in November of 1917, remember the calendar, I told you about that, this, they only had a couple thousand Bolsheviks and took over Russia. And that's why the National Socialists thought they could do that too, which is ironic because the National Socialists' mortal enemy were the communists. But it failed miserably. They would, after the war, or after Hitler took power, they'd have these dra dramatic reenactments of Hitler marching through Munich, and this is a painting of it, and they would reenact this glorious occasion. Actually, it was pretty humiliating. There were a few soldiers that focused around uh, the opera house right there. There are Nazi, um, old free corps members, members of the Nazis going in. They were quickly surrounded by the police. Nobody joined the rebellion. The Reichswehr came out, uh, and Hitler had to surrender kind of meekly, very meekly. Ludendorff, they tried to demand his surrender, and Ludendorff looked at the soldiers who surrounded them and said, do you know who I am? walked right through him, they kind of parted open for him, and he went back to his, to his mansion, and he was never arrested for this. He would always be the focal point of future potential right-wing rebellions all the way through until the end of the decade. This should end the Nazis right there. This was kind of a joke, um, and it's seen as an example of these right-wing dictators coming out of nowhere. But there was a sympathetic judge at Hitler's trial. And this judge allowed... Oops, there's Hitler in jail. Allowed Hitler to turn the trial into a forum where he could spew out his authoritarian... his authoritarian um, rhetoric his ideology, which is very similar to what he is learning from the brand new fascist government in Italy. And in it, he said that Germany should not have lost, Germany should return to greatness, and the Treaty of Versailles uh, has destroyed us, and the communists and their leaders have destroyed us, and we must fight back, or we will all be taken over by the Soviet Union. And instead of this destroying the party, even though the party would be weakened, Hitler only got a light sentence, which turned it almost at Landisburg Prison outside of Munich, which would become, ironically, a concentration camp in the 1930s. But he would become somewhat of a minor celebrity. And a lot of the wealthiest people in Germany began to look at Hitler as maybe somebody who will be able to be used to stop the communists. So here he is in prison, and that's a comical picture of him in prison with his leader, Hoisin. But he had much of his staff, including Friedrich Hess, or Rudolf Hess, who was his personal secretary. 
And in it, he dictated to Haas his memoir. And it was almost like a country club. He had, he had a, um, a couple cells that had furniture and wallpaper. He uh, had catered meals by admirers as somebody who was going to stand up against this weakness in Germany. And you could tell his memoir was dictated almost verbatim because it is a confusing rant that shows Hitler's toxic ideology, but also certain gifts he has. Because he was in many ways incompetent, foolish, arrogant about arrogant in his stupidity, but he had certain gifts on how to influence people, like a carnivore. His memoir would be called My Struggle or Mein Kampf. And that is from one of the original printings of it, that cover. And I've had to read it for a class. And it's a horrific thing to read, not only because of the toxic ideology in it, but also because it is really hard to read. It's all over the place. He rants against communists and other enemies, against the Treaty of Versailles. And then in the middle of a rant against communists and Jews, he goes on a rant against syphilis. And he keeps coming back to the evils of syphilis. And this is part of it to show about the decadence and the immorality of the new Weimar Republic, but also maybe something happened to him as a soldier. I don't know. But this would become required reading in the 1930s. He wanted to redo it into a more coherent book, and that never actually happened. You cannot buy this book, for the most part, in Germany. But a lot of people still have it. I saw it for sale as an antique in the same store I saw the, the German marks. It was really expensive, and they could sell it as a historical artifact. It's a very weird uh, kind of loophole in the rule. But in it, he laid out Nazi ideology. And here is a rally after he got out of prison, and that is in Munich, a famous church in Munich, still there. Uh, you want to see the Glockenspiel. Uh, a lot of people come watch the Glockenspiel. But Nazi ideology, and let's lay it out. So, Nazi ideology. And I should have backtracked just a little bit. It's very much like fascist ideology. Very much. It's fascist ideology, but like every different country, it has their own elements uh, inside Germany. And what do the Germans have against vowels? Now, don't get me wrong, we all don't like vowels, but I don't understand. But let's get to the uh, Treaty of Versailles, and if you explain it, I will, we'll get to it. You know, the Germans, hey, I don't know. So, <laughs> first off, the Treaty of Versailles. So, get back to the evil of all evils, the Treaty of Versailles. This treaty that was placed upon us in a war that Germany shouldn't have lost. And here's an anti-Treaty of Versailles poster showing enemies surrounding, occupying, or taking parts of Germany. And Germany surrounded by potential enemies. And they lost their army. And must take uh, blame for the war. This is a cartoon I showed you before, but it's a very classic one of showing Wilson, Lloyd George of Britain, and... Clemenceau of France, leading Wilson or leading Germany to the gallows, and it's a guillotine. I find it interesting that it is Clemenceau, the French, and yes, the Germans would use the guillotine, the Nazi Germany, to execute political prisoners. And here, that's the Treaty of Versailles of Germans working and slaving uh, at the mill, at the grinder, and turning the mill, and being whipped for the Treaty of Versailles. A whole generation this lost generation that has to work. And Nathan has a very good point about Hungarian. The Magyar language is crazy. It's just, yeah, all consonants. And it's, it's also awesome. I like it a lot. And look at Welsh. But the German language is very descriptive, and they had a term for their anger in the Treaty of Versailles. And the term was Dostatigelenda. Okay, I totally butchered it with a terrible American accent. But that means the stab in the back. And we mentioned this once before. Don't forget the stab in the back. 
And this idea that German soldiers were winning at the war and then bang, somebody in back. And here shows, first off, the very element of German soldier kill. And this, you can imagine how appealing this was to veterans. Veterans who felt mistreated after the war, which they were, like every war in every country. Veterans come back and are ignored and people do not understand their problems, which, yeah, they don't, but don't even allow for people to understand that issue that they don't understand. There's no empathy for soldiers, which is a very common thing to this day in the United States. That's one of my issues. But this is appealing to them. Their sacrifice had to be been for something and we were cheated. Let's make our sacrifice for something. We'll, make, we'll reestablish Germany. And so here it is businessmen lined up who are getting rich from the war, but we'll have implications, and some of you might know, like bankers and financiers, stabbing the Germans in the back. Here's another one, stabbing them back, and this one is very particular, and add this to your notes. The stab in the back more and more would be related to socialist, and you see the red here, communist. The communists were opposed to the war, and they, I mentioned this yesterday with the Spartacus rebellion, and they caused the war, or they caused Germany to be defeated. An enemy within. And see how this fits in with total war. We have an enemy within our, in our own country, the communists. And how can we be a strong country when we have enemies within, like the communists, with a huge ally, the Soviet Union? The stab in the back. And so we have to find who either allowed for the communists or more importantly, who enabled them. Who are traitors within our midst. And remember fascism. A lot of what makes fascism such a powerful ideology is not for what it believes, but for its enemies. It will find the enemies of the people. And who are the enemies for those who thought Germany shouldn't have lost? The socialists. And that's where you get the scapegoat. Demonize the others and xenophobic. Xenophobic is fear of outsiders. So, fear of this other. Demonize those, especially scapegoat those who don't have either a lot of power in society who are, or there's already prejudice against. Another people group to demonize are people who now are demanding rights and maybe getting rights. If you are part of the group that had rights, If you're part of that group, to many people who are part of that group, and they are part of this group that has rights, and they see somebody else trying to get those rights, to the souls on top, they don't look at those people who want to get rights as, oh, look, these are freedom fighters demanding rights. To many of them, it looks like they're trying to knock me off my pedestal. They're trying to take the little I have away from me. This is a threat, and I hope this is familiar. This idea goes all the way back to Bacon's Rebellion in American history, where poor whites didn't have much, but what did they have? They weren't slaves. They were white. And remember, I talked about this time after time in history. So it happens in other countries too. And this gets to the important and or scary point. If people think this can't happen here, uh, yes. So who's the number one threat? The communists. We've talked about that already. They're the ones who don't believe in social Darwinism. They want to equalize wealth. They want to take wealth away from the capital, capitalists and have better working conditions for all people. Now, you might argue that might or might not work, but that is the goal of true communists. And you can see why the wealthiest individuals in Germany supported the Nazis, or in Italy they supported the, the fascists, or some of the wealthiest people in America, they idealized Mussolini and tried to overthrow Roosevelt. Next, they hated the liberals. We talked about this before with fascism. Liberal ideals mean liberal ideals mean a weakening of the state. Democracy, individual freedoms, I talked about that at the beginning of the class. So liberal ideas of equal rights weakens us. Democracy weakens us. So they are, by definition, anti-liberal, anti-socialist. They hate them. Which is kind of ironic, isn't it? They use the term National Socialist. They blamed some businessmen who were war profiteers and got rich. But this has an important connotation. 
as they said it, there are good businessmen who understood the glory of Germany and bad ones, especially the financiers or bankers. We've talked about this before. I think you know where this is going. Also, the vast number of Eastern Europeans, Poles, we've talked about this before, Russians, who happen to be now the big communist state, Ukrainians, uh, Slovakians, Rome, um, Serbs, Slavs. And these inferior, this inferior race is weakening the Aryan race. And many of them are either moving in or to Germany, or more importantly, Slavic countries like Poland. In, in, um, in Poland, there are huge populations of German speaking German ethnic people. And the idea that Slavic, inferior Slavs, are not only governing Germans, but polluting and destroying that Germanic blood. But who's behind them all? Who are the leading communists? Who are the bankers? Many of the liberals. And of course, the biggest population of Jews in the world is in the Soviet Union and Poland. Jews. The Jews are behind them all. Here is a World War II National Socialist propaganda poster of Jews actually behind the Great Alliance of Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union. And look at the caricature of the face, the way they draw this. This will be seen time after time, but you will see this also in the United States. And remember we talked about and you saw Henry Ford was intensely anti-Semitic. I should add one more thing. And I forgot to type this down. Please write this down. In fact, I'm going to type this down because I, it's so important I don't want to forget it. There is intense ideology against the educated classes, against science, for lots of reasons. First off, science technically is not ideological. The National Socialists are all beliefs and ideological. The only truth is what they believe in. And so that's part of it, but also a lot of the leading scientists were Jewish. And so the Nazis, the National Socialists, are intensely anti-scientists. A lot of scientists would be driven out of Germany. Some would flee all the way to Britain in the United States, most famously Albert Einstein, not just because he is Jewish, but because of the anti-science feeling. And this is actually, let's be very clear about it, whew, that's my, thank goodness, because many of these scientists would be leaders in new, uh, the new atomic technology, jet technology, and Germany could have been ahead, and who knows how this could have altered the outcome of World War II. But fortunately, Nazi Germany was always anti-science. Oh, sure, they'd make a big deal about scientific Nazi, of the science of Nazi Germany, and they would have great, they would have great inventions like the jet engine or the ballistic rocket called the V2. But they were always anti-science. So, and, but it is an important element. Educated classes aren't technically ideological. Oh, yes, they certainly believe Jews were responsible. But don't think of it in terms of the Jews did it. The Jews were behind the communists. Some of the leading communists were Jews, especially in the Soviet Union. Uh, the leader of the Red Army during the Civil War was Leon Trotsky, who was Jewish. But also, they blamed a lot of the liberal ideology on Jewish thinkers. But then the bankers, who they said were all Jews. We talked about this myth of the Jewish banker. Jewish bankers were getting rich off the war, and then when they had a chance to win, they stabbed them in the back. Let's look back at that picture right here I showed you. This one, that is why it's the, this is the Jewish banker. They got rich and then stabbed us in the bank. Oh, this picture should show us we want to be National Socialist or Socialist. And see that caricature? That is a caricature of a Jew. Look at the face. You see it? Horrific, without a doubt. So with that, let's get to a couple things real quick for the end. 
Also, this concept, and this is one thing about the superior race. This is the concept of the master race. And remember I told you about this fake German ideology of the Aryan back in the creation of German culture before World War I. But this idea of this pure German race, and these Slavs and Jews are trying to impurify them. This will make them weak. And that's where you get all the propaganda of the glorified German family. And it's going to be very agrarian. They hated the cesspool of cities. And it's always going to be in the, so the agrarian, idealized, blonde-haired, blue-eyed German family. Here is Hitler Youth, Hitler Jungian. Uh, and so you see this idealized German and in fact, they really adopted a lot of fake German science to come up with like the idealized German face. They would even like measure forehead and the length of the, your, the width of your brow, uh, the width of your forehead, the width of your cheek to come up with the perfect German face. And to prove that this is all has scientific background. And so this really does fit in with the fake science of social Darwinism and that fake racial science I showed you before with all the different races. And this concept that the Slavs are jealous and fearful of them and want to impurify that weak or impurify the Aryan race with weaker blood and therefore destroy Germany. And this fits in very well with German, the idea of German culture before World War I, thus appealing to that conservative ideal of going back to the way things should have been. And I should add, I almost forgot. Some of you might be thinking, wait a second, Hitler's not blonde hair. He's got a greenish blue eyes, but he doesn't have blonde hair. How does he fit in this? Well, that was the amazing thing. That's why they measured all the width of the face. So you might have a different color hair. That could happen. But they could still find the perfect Aryan face. And this might shock those of you at home. Hitler's face was the exact replica of the perfect Aryan face. Can you believe it? I, it's unreal. Science works. Science -y. And that is why they bought into that science of eugenics that started in the United States, to, race, to get racial purity. And that's why they got involved with breeding people. They set up these, these horrific, the whole idea is horrific, of breeding farms to get these perfect Aryan men and women together to have perfect Aryan ch children. And this shows what happens if you have, where my mouse is, the perfect German family, these are the, the descendants of this. But if you have a few imperfect members, you get this mongrel race right here. And that is German racial purity. And the whole idea is then we must uh, make sure these don't mix, but there's something else. You notice there's so many more. The Germans are going to be outnumbered unless they breed a lot. And so that is one thing I have to get to. That is why German racial ideology really did appeal to other places. It appealed to the Netherlands. The Netherlands, uh, the Dutch language is kind of a form of Germanic language, and they had a lot of recruits for what started as Hitler's personal guard, but would become a big part of the German army, the SS. And they also appealed to Norwegians. Here are Norwegians joining the SS. In fact, it was a, Norwe it was a Norwegian SS members that were the last ones to hold out in May, end of April, early May of 1945 in the Reichstag, in the German capital. There were Norwegian SS men fighting against the Soviets, partially because they knew they could never go home. They were traitors. So, last two things, get real quick for the, I bought to the bell. Ah, the glory days of the bell. This fits in with Mussolini and the idea of the leader is always right. The leader principle, der Führer. And that is the leader. And the idea is he alone is on top, this very social Darwinistic ideal. And that is, um, and everybody must pledge loyalty to them. When Germany, uh, one of the big things Hitler did is he had the army eventually pledge loyalty not to the German state, but to Hitler, der Führer. And he had this ability to sway masses and pull them in, to play on their fears called demagoguery, we talked about before. And he was their fearer. Mussolini was El Duce, the leader, the fascist dictator of Spain, all the way until 1976. Francisco Franco was El Supremo. And, you know, you see this a lot. The leader will get this kind of, the, um, 
showing that they're above everybody else and they set up this cult of the leader. His, his picture would be everywhere and the leader is never wrong. And this is an important thing because even, even when the leader is incorrect, he's not incorrect. You're incorrect. You misunderstood the leader. The leader is never wrong. So the leader could say one thing today and say another thing tomorrow and you darn well better accept what the leader said. Remember, this kind of fascist state gets its power by state, by terror. And if you don't agree with the leader, you're an enemy. You are weakening the state. And so, one important element of the leader, and the way the leader is able to maintain power and control, is if the leader is never wrong, then how do people ever know what actually is correct? You never know. And so the leader, and this is really important, in authoritarian states, they're dishonest. They lie all the time. They lie all the time. And this is not just because they're pathological liars, which almost certainly they are. They lie about everything, but they lie about everything. And if they lie about everything, you never know the truth, ever. And if you never know the truth, who do you believe? If all the experts and scientists are wrong, who do you believe? If the media is wrong, who do you believe? You don't know the truth. Who knows? So just tell me what to do. You believe the leader. Authoritarian leaders lie all the time. It's a source of power. And so you get people in, in business that can lie. Politicians can lie. It gives them power. So a couple more things. That's why you have Hitler's face all over. And this would be the slogan. I'm Volk, I'm Reich, I'm Fuhrer. One people, one nation, one leader. And this is Germany as Deutsch, or I'm sorry, the German people all behind the leader. And you'll notice something. Germany behind the leader. Look at the people. First off, this one, it's only Hitler. It's only Hitler. He is the only person we recognize. In the background, I show a picture, and I'll show it just a little bit. Do I have it here? No. But it's just um, there's a nameless face, like here. Who is this? It's not a person. That doesn't matter. These are just generic Germans, the mass. The only people that matter are the party leaders and Hitler. Look at them behind. They're not individuals. They're all part of a mass. Here's a vote for Hitler in 1930, a uh, poster for Hitler to vote yes for the new, uh, for the, it was called a plebal side, a choice for the German government. And look, the only person we recognize is Hitler. And they cut and paste a bunch of people behind, all Highland. Are they individuals? No. The only thing that matters, the only person that matters is Hitler. And that gets back to militarism. The soldiers' lives don't matter. It's military glory for the leader and the state, and the state is the leader. The state and the leader are the same. It's not how this affects Hitler. Uh, of how this affects Germany is how it affects Hitler. And so, that is where you get, it's the mass. It's all the people together. Das Volk is the people. And so that's where you get these mass rallies in Nuremberg. If you get a chance, go to Nuremberg in Germany. It's north of Munich. So that Munich would have these, these rallies. And they've kept this big, stark cement field where they rallied. But, all the people listening watching, idealizing Hitler. And what an amazing picture. But look at it again. There's only one individual, Hitler, giving the speech. Everybody else is a mass. These rallies, rallies like this, are the sign of an authoritarian dictator. You bring the mass together. And anybody who does not cheer or join in, they're seen as odd or seen as weird. And in this mass euphoria. But, it's kind of a rewarding experience. Individuals here, think about it, if you're alone in this mass, you feel like you're nothing. But Hitler would bring that out and say, you are nothing alone, but together with all of us, following the leader, you are something. That is why when Hitler took power, they got everybody this wonderful thing, a wireless radio, 
so they could hear propaganda and that is why Nazi Germany invested in television the brand new science that was literally just coming out now the kind of TV they were looking at would not be the kind that would eventually take over the late 1940s that would be invented in Idaho but that is why they use the term socialist it is not socialist in socialist ideology they, they socialism does not believe in social Darwinism the entire tenet the basis of Nazism is social Darwinism socialist as a social group together we are socially tied together as one socialism and this is gross Deutschland greater Germany all together as one and you notice they're not people there's no faces it is just hands an entity not individual people individuals are weak so it is a social as social all together as one behind the leader now true socialism all the people have rights and freedoms and economic power idealized socialism I know that's not what happened in the Soviet Union and so what are we gonna do we need living room I was gonna stop but I want to finish this last bit labor what is labor wrong that is the concept that Hitler said we need living space the Germans need more room and not just reestablishing the old German Empire they need more good land and where is the land in the east and this picture shows how the German population under Nazism is growing and they need more land and here's Hitler with Lebensraum grasping for more land and where's the land Poland Ukraine the Baltic states like Latvia Lithuania and Estonia and of course the Soviet Union aren't those Slavs aren't those the communists they're just wasting the land so what he's saying is we have to move east and set up an agrarian German state. Get Germans out of this overcrowded cesspool of the cities where you have all these different groups and people coming in and let true Germanic culture survive outside the cities. Oh, by the way, what about the people there? Well, let's get to the root, um, the root of the word sloth those who are needed will be slaves the rest I think you know the answer and that's Nazi ideology and so Hitler from day one in Mein Kampf is saying we're gonna take that land in the East and he is setting up a titanic struggle between good German Aryan races or race and the evil Soviet Slavic communist Jewish dominated East there's no plan for world struggle but there is a plan for a war in the East and that's talking about the greater German nation during World War II this would be greater Germany all this area that include Poland Austria uh, part of Croatia Slovakia all this area would be annexed by Germany and all this area here was supposed to be the Germanic Reich that was going to be that German kingdom that would go to about the Ural Mountains here the Volga River actually and this could be some rough state but they would take all this land and the people there would be driven out starved to death or work as slaves so they're predicting a war in the East so tomorrow Hitler would take power I'm also going to assign a movie one of my favorites I I like it called the <laughs> I've um, oh the gathering storm from a great series called World War II in color we we'll watch that you're gonna do a worksheet you're gonna hand in the worksheet I'll, so I'll put that up tomorrow I am going to finish up one little thing of the Great Depression tomorrow then we're gonna watch that in class and that means tomorrow oh my goodness tomorrow I will want copies of your notes so go and take a picture of your notes to get credit I will also put this up in assignment at the end of the day are there any questions none all right 
I went a little over an hour, a little bit longer than I wanted, but I think I went through a lot. I hope you understood this. I will post this up online, but don't forget, yes, I want the key bullet points, but you have to get what I'm talking about. And hopefully I'll get my computer to work and I'll be able to show you more pictures tomorrow. It's going to show you a couple of things, and for some reason, it wasn't right clicking. So, if there's no questions, have a great day. 